right. I am <laughs> Ian J. Downey with Not Fest. We do a thing called Screen Crusades where we talk to film folks such as yourself. Ari, you are not only the front man of the band first, Jason. You are, of course, in fact, the first Jason. How are you, sir? <laughs> it's a surrealistic experience, I tell you. Every day is like a, a, a magical unfolding of of horror uh adventures it's something you know uh honestly ryan this adventure started when i was 14 years old and it hasn't stopped and um i'm i'm absolutely very very honored and happy to have gotten the opportunity to be the first jason and uh i love all the fans and and i'm just very grateful you're right. It hasn't stopped. I mean, it, it wasn't that long ago that I I saw NECA did the toy of Jason's mom, who's got it going oh, on, sure. and your era of Jason, the OG that that started it all. Um, I mean, and that's you know, I mean, who would have who would have thought making that movie back in the day that that you know decades later you'd be able to hold an action figure of yourself you know back then it was oh like star God. wars got action figures and that was kind of it as far as big movie franchises well th that's a good point yeah I, and that that jason jason's mom who has got it going on for sure um you know betsy palmer my gosh she she was quite the number in her day and uh what a wonderful lady um she took me under her wing when i met her of course, we didn't meet on the set because all the scenes I did were in the lake. Mm -hmm. um, but but Betsy and I just kind of hit it off. She um she had the same birth date as my actual mother, November first. Wow! And being a Scorpio, they bring out the best in people. November seventh, baby. November seventh. Oh, 7th. there you go. <laughs> I inadvertently complimented you. You did. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bringing out the Good best of you right now. <laughs> yes, man. no, it's true. You're right. You see, there you go. Yeah, I was right. But um, no, she she was the funniest person. She could get people to literally fall out of their seats laughing because I would come out in this like metal metal gear. You know, I'd be like Mister Metal Dude, and she'd be wearing her little old lady outfit. You know, and then she'd just start making penis jokes and people would just fall out of their chairs you know but that little figure of her which was such a nice thing of them to do um because they never they included me which was awesome and with all these cool little um um little things that he can wear uh he's got a t-shirt he's got he actually has a scarf made of um pond scum so how many how many people can claim that their action figure has a pond scum scarf? I mean, it's <laughs> and you know we'll get into that later. But I love all the imagery associated with little Jason. Um, and but you know uh, that figure, man. If anybody has it out there, especially if you have it with my autograph on it, is worth quite a pretty penny today. I tell you what. <laughs> I, um, I should have saved some of those, Ryan, man. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um that's me you know <laughs> betsy was the greatest and you know um what an honor to be to be made into an action figure with her like wow right. the two and, um, yeah i used to bring her flowers when we would do conventions together and you know a couple of joints and stuff and we would hang out and talk and and she would have parties in her room at the horror conventions and she would often say ari pass the joint it's not a microphone <laughs> like she could get people to laugh like you wouldn't believe man but that said she was a serious actress who i mean i don't mean serious she would she would want me to say that she was a great actress and she um she was doing theater all the way up into her 80s literally she would yeah. do plays like love letters where you have to there's these very long monologues and she was just amazing and i missed the heck out of her but you know yeah um friday the 13th was kind of an anomaly because let's face it um 
I'm I'm talking to Ice Nine Kills fans, so you you guys probably know the the genre better than me. But hey, Texas Chainsaw Massacre was first, okay? TCM was first, then you had Michael. But Friday the Thirteenth was never intended to be really a part of that trilogy or right. or or family of slashers. Because the scene at the end where I jump out of the water wasn't even in the original script. The original script, it just ends, you know, she's cut off mom's head and that's the end of the movie. Okay. Now, Paramount Pictures said, okay, we want something more than that. We want a different ending. We need a surprise ending. So they looked at the movie Carrie and that's how this ending scene was going. But even then, Ryan, the idea that Jason was going to be a violent slasher was not ever even in their minds. Now, that final scene, okay, was left up to a certain amount of unknown. Mm -hmm. The director, Sean Cunningham, said to me, okay, he says, the cameras are rolling, Ari. He wanted to scare Adrian King. He didn't want to say action. So he says, the cameras are rolling. So I just want you to go out in the water. Don't let her see the mask. And, okay, you're not going to be able to hear me say action. So you're the director on this one, Ari. And I was like, I'm the director? You know, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> so go out in the water and look up wait for the bubbles to clear and then my only direction was and then just come out and 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 grab adrian <laughs> wow so i'm a little boy of age 14 now you imagine how much has been left up to chance in the hands of this little boy because there was a movie called dementia 13 it came out years, maybe decades before that definitely Victor Miller was influenced by whether he admits it or not. Dementia 13 is about a woman who commemorates the untimely drowning of her daughter on her property in a pond on the same day every year. And she's a very wealthy woman. So it's kind of like a little more of a soap opera with these romances. And, but this movie is by Francis Ford Coppola. It's his first foray into feature film. Mm -hmm. And um, it's in black and white and it's absolutely wonderful. It opens with this amazing scene where there's a, they're, they're in a boat on a lake and it's black and white. And if you saw it on a big screen, I imagine it must have been spectacular. I've never had that pleasure. But the whole screen is black because it's the lake. And then this little white boat comes out. And there's a couple in the boat. And there's a woman. And there's a man. And he's struggling to row, struggling. And she says, don't. Don't struggle. And, and he, he says to her, oh, yeah. Wouldn't that be terrible for you if I died of a heart attack right here? Then you'd never get the money. And sure enough, he dies of a heart attack. <laughs> anyway, in that film, I don't want to ruin anything for anybody. There's a time where a cadaver comes out of the lake, revealing some evidence. But it doesn't come out alive. It just comes <laughs> out and kind of flomps over the boat yeah. like a dead cadaver that surfaced somehow. So I don't know if that's what Sean was looking for, but here's the catch. It was an independent film. There was only so much sunlight. Okay. So here's what little Ari did. I was in the water. I was underwater now thinking, how am I going to come out of the water? Am I going to come out of the water? Like, you know, gently, and then I just thought, no, that bitch killed my mom. And I just grabbed the side of the boat and I come wailing out in that famous gesture, as everyone knows. This, okay. 
And then I look down and this nice lady that I've never met before, I realized doesn't have a clue of what's going on. And I am now going to slam right into her. And the whole thing's on camera. So famously, there was, I won't go into all the details, but Adrian King did an amazing job. There would be two takes. The first take was cut when you see her reaction, which was an actual reaction. If you look at the, the magic of GIF technology, you could see <laughs> they've, they've sandwiched that first take in between the second take in which I was instructed to just sort of go through this motion. So you'll see it's a yellow background because it was filmed in October, by the way. Mm -hmm. You know, I went home in the summer of August of 1979 thinking, well, that was it. They called me back in October. So it's that yellow background. Then there's that close up. It's, it's green. And that's the first take where poor Adrian <laughs> registers absolute fear. Um, yes. And then, so magnificently, she did the, the second take without revealing at all that she knew I was there. So that shows what a skilled actress um, Adrian is. But, yeah. you know, I was just a little boy playing around. And I thought in many ways... That, that, you know, it would be like when you're at the beach or in a swimming pool and it's like, oh, let's, let's, let's splash around, you know? No, she had no idea. And so between the takes, there's this famous picture where Adrian's kind of like this and I'm <laughs> adjusting the teeth. I don't know if you've seen it. Yep. In that moment, I'm being admonished by Sean Cunningham, you know, not, not severely, but he said, now Ari, we only have one more take and we have this much daylight. So this time just do X, Y, Z. And this time he said, please don't manhandle our actress. <laughs> Something to that effect. So I thought, oh my gosh, you know, am I a depraved child or something? Until I went home and I saw how they did that edit and I felt vindicated. I said, yes. And later on, of course, you know, Sean said to me, you know, way to go, you know, like between <laughs> him and myself. But he didn't he didn't want, you know, he didn't want uh, his whole his whole scheme to be revealed. But I will say that. So then, if you will, well, well let me first preface it by saying bravo, Sean Cunningham. Direction is not easy to do direction, you know, and he just anticipated what would happen with absolute genius. Um, I worked with him on two films. I never saw him raise his voice once. He was always, but you were always absolutely certain of what, what he wanted. Mm -hmm. You felt safe with him as a director. And I think that um, Perhaps his forte um, lies in, in his ability to direct, you know, acting, you know? <laughs> right. Like, you know, so, but he's really good at working with kids because, you know, he's kind of, he's not that tall. So, you know, he's kind of on your level. And so mm -hmm. he, made, he always made me feel really good. And, and, um, and of course, Tom Savini and Tasso Stavrakos, it was like working with the uh, Cheech and Chong of horror. They were just absolutely hilarious and so much fun mm -hmm. to work with so when you know when that was done we were like wow this is but still ryan we had no idea absolutely no idea like you said no idea that fans would be so um well they just they just kind of associated it again with with michael and leatherface even though it was just a boy mm -hmm. so they wanted more jason so mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's kind of how it all, you know, so I might, I don't know, uh, who knows? It, 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 it was left up to, um, up to chance. And the fans were the ones that said, Ooh, we love that part with, with little Jason. So in many ways, it, it kind of presaged the type of fan interaction that we're experiencing nowadays. Yeah which was pretty rare back then for, for fans to have that kind of, you know, I remember them saying, Oh, 
they screened the film in Fort Wayne w without the ending before. Mm -hmm. And that's why they said we needed to do the new ending because they felt the new ending, you know, didn't work. I guess they had a test test audience or something. I grew up in but, Indiana, so it's fun to know that that was in Fort Wayne. <laughs> well, you know, Fort Wayne, man, Fort Wayne is uh, is is a big punk horror punk town. That's where Grave Robber and B Movie Monsters and Creep and all those bands are from. Mm -hmm. And First Jason is going to be playing there. We're going to be playing at uh, Pierre's on September second with B Movie Monsters and Creep, and then we're going to be playing. Um, at a big theater there and that's coming up in 2023 there's going to be a big ba uh, bash there um yeah so there you go and that's a, wonderfully into my next question which i was gonna you know we know uh, of course about your part of the legacy of the friday the 13th franchise i'm really curious to know when and how your love of horror punk began and obviously, you know, you were a teenager in the late 70s, early 80s, which is ground zero for punk rock. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, well, here's the crazy thing. OK. Um, I did get to. I was friends with the lead singer from Reagan Youth. Amazing. Dave Insurgent. And he was one of the coolest people I ever met. But see, here's the thing. I was a jazz piano guy. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I read that you were classically trained, and you even went was, back to that after the movie. I was the jazz guy, man. Yeah. I was jazz, funk, world beat, world music, prog. You know, I was into like like one year I didn't listen to anything but John Coltrane for a year, literally, while I was at NYU, and and at that same time, yeah. Dave would come by and, and listen to me practice. And then some, and then sometimes I would go over to CBGB's and hear bands like Bad Brains, uh, White Zombie, I saw, uh, which totally blew me away. So, and at that time, Ryan, I never thought that I would be playing a heavy metal guitar. <laughs> oh my gosh. I was way into jazz, man, you know? And um, yeah, so ultimately you know what happened there was i was into progressive jazz and then you got this kind of kenny g style jazz came out so with long hair and everything people just said oh oh you play jazz you're like kenny g and i'm like no you know i'm into like ronald shannon jackson and and and, and decoding society and vernon reed and like you know and that became living color and like the whole all these black rock coalition and all these cool things. No, no, man. No, no, man. You're Kenny G. <laughs> I was like, ah. So I started playing world music. So I was playing world music. That took me all over the world. I worked for Interscope Records. I worked for a, an artist from Nigeria named Majek Fashek, who you can hear on Spotify, the albums that I did with him. Little Steven produced them. Oh, wow. I also worked, yeah, I worked for Tough Gong Records, which is Bob Marley's label. I even got to travel to West Africa as a performer wow. um, and all over Europe. But little, I was little Steven, a.k.a. Silvio Dante. <laughs> that's right. dude. Also happens to be in some band. I believe they're called the E Street Band. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. And working with him was amazing. Uh, he was he was very, very hands on. He was he, he, he loved my playing. He thought it was such a hoot that I was in that band because everybody else was from Nigeria. And, um, and you know, as a, as a kid growing up in Indiana, if it wasn't for little Steven, I would have had no idea about South Africa and apartheid and Mandela and all of that, you know, incredible yeah, he was, crazy stuff that was happening. Out that's there. a great point. Man. Yeah, he, was, him. Yeah. he was totally, he, he was totally instrumental in um, bringing those movements together. And honestly, at that time, I really thought that there was a, a future in that kind of fusion of world music and rock. But, you know, you could say that artists like Santana have been doing that all along. It's not necessarily something new. And Santana, whose birthday it was just the other day, um, he's still touring. 
and you know, uh, he's a big inspiration to me too. But so what happened was this. Somebody emailed me and said, did you sign this photo? And when I was in world music and touring and playing Red Rocks Amphitheater, I was like, a photo? What photo? And they said, you're Ari Lehman, the guy that played the first Jason Voorhees, right? And I said, yeah. He said, well, I just paid $50 for this on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, now, wait a second. That's not my autograph. So sure enough, it turned out somebody was forging my autograph and selling it. Wow. And I got to the bottom of that. And actually that vendor claimed they were third party and returned some of the money. So, but then I said, wow, there's this old market, you know, and what ended up happening was I was invited to Chiller Theater Fangoria Convention. Mm -hmm. And this was the original Fangoria Convention at the Meadowlands. And oh my God, I got there and there was thousands of people there. And me and my buddy who, who played in the reggae band with me, we were like, what is going on? <laughs> and we went up the elevator and this big, really muscular guy goes, you're Ari Lehman. I'm Kane Hodder. I played Jason in part seven. Two. I was like, oh, uh, what? Mm -hmm. I was like, and I saw Tom Savini. And that's when I met Betsy for the first time. Okay. Wow. They were like, okay, Ari, you have to go in that room. There's all these people waiting. So I went by the line. It was like literally hundreds of people. So I saw Betsy across the room and I went, oh my God, it, it's Betsy Palmer. So you know, I didn't think of anything of it. I just went over to her and I went, mom. <laughs> and here tells you something about Betsy. Is she just looked at me. I mean, she didn't even look at me. She just threw her arms wide open and gave me the most sincere hug. Then she put her hands on my shoulder and looked at me and said, now, who the fuck are you? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly how you gonna, want that to go. Amazing. She's gonna, she's gonna hug you first, and then ask you, and then of course when I said, "Oh," I told her, "I oh," and then you know she hugged me again. Of course, and you know we became such friends. And I'm glad that the first person I ever met when doing a horror convention was Betsy because right the way that she worked with fans, like I said about you, Scorpios, being bringing out the best in people. Wow, I've never seen anything like that. She really defined how special the interaction between a fan and, a, and an actress is. And she, I remember, I mean, she would go on for 10, 20 minutes with people. We had one show where, I mean, and she wouldn't stop for lunch. I mean, there was once um, a monster mania where I had to stand on her table. She still had like 50 people at the end of the day. And I was like, look, guys, you know, Betsy needs to get a tuna fish sandwich or something. You know, she just and and still she just had so much energy. She she um, and then also she would make everybody feel special. For instance, I remember at the Meadowlands this big guy comes up and he was a big, you know, like, you know, from New Jersey, kind of, you know, with a leather jacket and, you know, uh, and this big scar going right down his face, man, like one of those gang scars. And you were like, damn. And he was like, really sincere. He was like, I just want to say I've been a fan, blah, blah, blah. And I was blown away by this guy. And you know, what a sweet guy, you know, his family. And then, but no, Betsy, the first thing he says to her, him, because you could see he was totally, he was so excited to meet her. And she said, what a lovely scar. May I touch it? Wow. And she reached out and caressed his scar. <laughs> and at that moment, I don't know, it was like something happened in my mind where I just, wow, I realized there's a, such a different moment and, and an importance in that moment 
when somebody is meeting someone they've seen on screen and that you should you should let your ego step away yeah and 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 uh but i could do that a million times over and i'd still never 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 I mean, it just speaks to her character and i mean that that's something he may have never even heard before you know and to hear it in that moment and from her oh he melted that oh, guy was like a yeah. baby in her hands after that <laughs> he just melted and everybody around uh, and this is long before cell like phones with selfies and all that kind of thing you know she was just that person. She told me she loved to do dinner theater. I mean, between you and me, she said, I mean, between you and me and everyone else listening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> she said, she said, fuck Hollywood. She told me. She said, I love doing dinner theater. I can do whatever I want. I don't have to sit around waiting for the phone to ring. And I'm always in an environment that I love, which is the theater, learning great literature. She she was in Gigi on Hollywood. I mean, on Broadway, pardon me, on Broadway with, you know, some, all those big, she was in all these Broadway plays. I, I've been given playbills with Betsy Palmer. So what she really showed is that it's the emotion with which you portray a character that gives that response from the audience, not your technique. Like you can have technique for days and people should have technique, but then you should throw it out the fucking window and have a feeling. And she told me that, just put a feeling behind it. And see, that's why, you know, I said, bitch killed my mom. You know, that was my, that was my feeling. <laughs> You know, um, so I and and uh, so there you go. I think that gives us all a bunch of insights about Betsy Paul. Oh, absolutely. That's you probably have other questions. No, I do. I, I mean, it's magnificent. I could yeah. listen to this all all day, literally. Um, well, I could talk about her all day. She was she was something else. Well, I want to ask you. Uh, you know, in regard to obviously, you are a convention veteran, and fans get to meet you. They've gotten to know you. They're they know you. They know the band. They come to the gigs. With the Silver Screen Con in particular, where you and I will get to hang out again, because I'll also be I'll be moderating your panel there. Uh, oh, awesome! Very much looking forward to that. Uh, Who's on that panel? Uh, I believe uh, it's yourself and another guy that you mentioned by the name of Kane Hodder. Oh my God! I, I get we're, to I, do a panel with Kane Hodder. It has double jasoning. Been, it has been a long time. I think the last time we did a panel together was in Ireland in dublin Ireland. wow, wow. <laughs> i love that oh um, my gosh but yeah yes yeah i want to say i, I saw i rough. saw you guys on the panel together at monster palooza in pasadena but that would even that was man time flies that's that's been a long time years. ago yeah oh yeah. yeah sure no that's true yeah. yeah i think Derek mears was at that panel yes uh so I want to ask you about... So you were going to talk about Silver Screen Con. Well, let me jump in and say this. Please. A long time ago, I was working with some autograph vendor people and uh, right here at the center in Chicago, where I am at the community center. And um, I was, you know, I always like to, to play loud, loud rock that's fast while I sign because you know for instance like Motorhead or no effects or something I don't know what so it just keeps it keeps the beat going and um so the son of the vendor was there and he said he whispered something to his dad he's like there's an ice nine kills and I said what do you mean ice nine kills you mean Kurt Vonnegut <laughs> yeah yeah I'm from because Indiana, I was a, so yeah. I was I was a huge. I read all those Kurt Vonnegut books. Yeah. So as soon as I heard Ice Nine, anything, I said, and he goes, "No, no, who's Kurt Vonnegut?" <laughs> and they said, "No." So I said, "Okay." So he went out and he got the CD and he put it in, and I was like, "Whoa, who is this?" And he's like, "Ari, all the songs are about horror movies." I'm like, "What?" 
He's like, listen, da, 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 da. so, you know, American Nightmare, you know, all, all these songs, you know. So um, I was blown away. But anyway, uh, then it was months later, I get an email from Spencer Charnas. And we were in production on the Lord of the Lake album, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it was really well timed because he said, hey, could you jump in and sing on Thank God It's Friday? And I'm like, hell yes, I can. And uh, so Uptown Recording here in Chicago, which is amazing, which is where Nonpoint is kind of based out of, mm -hmm. who are kind of our big brother band, if you will. Um and they were actually there during some of the recording. Rashid from Nonpoint was there. So Rob Ruccia, the maestro engineer, who was also their sound man, um, he put he said, "Yeah, come on in. We got this. Boom, boom." Uh, Spencer had been very specific about the parts he needed, mm -hmm. and so I just did it. And you know, bang, bang. You know, Rob did a great. Uh, uh, mix on it and then i remember we threw it over to them and then they they mastered it and i was like wow so uh even then i didn't really have an inkling of what was going on and then upon the release of that i realized what i hope the world will soon realize which is how important the body of work that Spencer and Ice Nine Kills have put together because like the album before it, which, which comes from all literary sources. Right. Every trigger now, book. Yeah. Which is a great title. Okay. Um, in the, you know, every, <laughs> oh my God. but uh it's it's such um it reflects a comprehension and love of literary art and just like a total passion for it obviously but um and then its application to i think what they've done goes beyond new metal and emo and is now i guess i would call it theatrical metal i don't know if other yeah. people have used that phrase I, 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 I was i was with spencer the other day and we came up with a great phrase oft broadway <laughs> <laughs> broadway that, that's how i describe them from now on <laughs> well i think it's only a matter of time before there's a broadway show or an oft oft broadway show. Yeah. Oft. <laughs> <laughs> He's very good with the turn of phrase. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's a skill that has, you know, coining that those 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 phrases. Um, it reminds us of Poe or, um, you know, uh, um, even Dickens in a way, you know, those those very classic playing around with words, um, which I love and uh you know, um, you know, my writing tends to be more along the the mythical, mystical saga esque super. You know, you know, all Neil. I speak in steel. This is the seventh seal I wield on battlefield. My wrath will be revealed. You know, okay. So I'm coming from that place of of having been little Jason and kind of spinning it with irony that it's coming out of this kind of medium sized guy with long hair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but, uh, so that's, you know, we have a certain, but I just think that in their untiring embrace of the entire compendium of, of, of horror classics, I mean, and, and, video games and i mean come on mm -hmm. so yeah i'm clearly i'm deeply impressed by spencer but it's more than that i mean what could you what could you be more impressed by than the insight of someone to include you <laughs> <in what they're> <laughs> yeah 
just impressed that he knows like, his stuff. <laughs> really good idea, dude. You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I you know, being honest, and uh, I'm so glad that the song came out well. And I love the way it contrasts, you know, the voices. I like to think it shows the age in my voice, not not in a negative way, but right. you know, there's there's more of a grit of a yeah. There you go, and uh, sure. and he has that wonderful clarity in his voice. So then it went even further. We did a song called "The Scapegoat." And Spencer agreed to sing on the choruses of the scapegoat. So we have, we did the demon remix, but now we're going to do a, a remix with just his vo voices added. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, that's because we made a new music video for the scapegoat. So it's going to be the, the scapegoat video remix. And Spencer has even agreed to do a, a little cameo where he'll be on on a cell phone in mm -hmm. in the video where he's singing his part back. So, I mean, my gosh, that's, you know, artistic collaboration is is really the greatest level that you can reach. And I'm very happy with that song. And he knocked it out of the park. He's just singing in between the vocals. I mean, in between the chorus lines. But he knocked it out of the park. So um, there you go. And mutual exchange of yeah. And but more than that, if you were to say anything, you know, I'm always saying to people, you know, Spencer Charnas is the next Alice Cooper, but I don't even know if that sums it up enough. But it's just to say that, and I and I don't mean not to include each band member because each band member is also an integral part. And I know they've kind of, you know, allowed Spencer's name to be the name that everybody's saying. But I think that everyone would agree. I think that when you when you speak about Spencer, you're speaking about all of them. And they're all super personable and honest and the sweetest people. And I'm just amazed, quite frankly, that uh, it seems like there's 10 of them, of each of them. Right. You know, right. Like, yeah. <clears throat> Especially when you're when you're watching them on stage and there's so much happening and in the music and, and oh my god yeah yeah so there you go and and it becomes just a, an absolute thing where it, the visuals are so integral to what it is and I've been thinking about this a lot with TikTok and so many things we're watching musicians we're watching what musicians are doing with their hands you know. I, I'm a big fan of Indian music. So I'll be scrolling through and I'll see someone playing the tabla. Ooh, he's playing the tabla. And I go, oh man, he's really playing the tabla. I gotta click on this, you know? So, you know, or someone's playing Sarod or, 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 or sitar and you can see they're just doing it, man. Yeah. So I've kind of gotten into that with the guitar. You know, I get out there with the guitar because it's a heavy metal guitar. People are so surprised. I put it through a metal zone pedal, just like, dime bag or mm -hmm. exporter or one of those bands and uh you know it's absolutely um like playing thunder you know <laughs> like with your fingertips <laughs> yeah. right? yeah. so yeah. uh that's that's uh you know um um i'm a uh, you know i'd like to say you know I, i'm i'm inspired very inspired by by ice night kills and uh you know i i'm so glad that they included me as a part of of, of their family Mm -hmm. um i can't wait to see this new video i don't want to ask any questions because i know you can't tell me but i saw i did see a picture and i think they they did uh joe bob briggs as the judge oh should i say that, that that's okay right I, I mean you know there could be a funny strag for people watching this interview <laughs> and they they did i thought they put a big i saw a picture of it yeah, I'll I'll say uh I'll say if, if anyway, you know, you know, you know the OJ Simpson if I did it. I'll say if Joe Bob Briggs <laughs> plays the judge, man, he would look got, very he a, good. He got a pretty cool bailiff who has one oh, line there you go. Just, just deliver that <laughs> line with, with uh such conviction. Very cool. Yeah, yeah, because the <laughs> because proper facial hair. <laughs> yeah, indeed. It gives you it gives you the confidence to say, "All rise." When oh yeah! Oh yeah! 
<laughs> Here come the judge. Yeah, I, I, I did. I did. I gave him a few McConaughey's too. All rise, all rise, all rise. But I don't think they're, don't think they're gonna use those. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Very good. So you got to play with it. Keep the um, mood light. Keep the mood light. But he does look like a judge. He does. Oh, he and he's great. He's got the bolo tie and <laughs> phenomenal. Wait to wait to hear his name. The name. Uh, here's something I won't spoil. The name of his judge. <laughs> it's pretty great. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Pretty great. Oh um, all right. Well, this has been so much fun, and it, <laughs> if I couldn't already look forward to Silver Scream Con, oh my gosh, much. I'm that is to even more after this. Before, yeah, let me at least add when Please. we did Spookala, I have never seen so many people arrive, and just immediately they were in their happy place, and that convention has done what I've always felt was necessary was to acknowledge that metal and horror are hand in hand, especially with yes. uh, this younger generation. And we're not gonna leave out any generation. We want the collectors, but we have to speak to this new generation. You gotta keep it going, and pass the torch. And, and it just it proved it, I think. Yeah. Uh, we've been asked um, to perform again, a return engagement at O'Malley's in Ocala. That's on December 3rd. But I am so certain that we are all going to have so much fun at this Silver Screen Con. Oh. Wow. And I, I can't wait to do a panel with you and Mr. Kane Hodder himself. Mr. Hodder. Mr. Hodder. I, I hope he's wearing the gloves. He's got to have the well, gloves. Wait, you're kind of doing a Kane Hodder mustache now. Uh, it's kind of it's kind of a mix of an Ari Kane. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> no. It's like no. I'm getting it, I'm getting in character for the. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I oh, kept, you'll drive him nuts with that. I kept saying oh. on the, on the set the other day that uh, oh I just I put on this extra weight for the role as a character choice. <laughs> <laughs> I start I started getting ready for this a year ago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I'm not about it two days ago. Generally, a bailiff does have that kind of yeah a little bit, little bit punch yeah yeah you know. a little punch bailiff. <laughs> What does he do? He stands up. He sits down. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you're not chasing a lot of a lot of people. No, no. <laughs> um, well, Ari, awesome man. So much fun. Looking so forward to it. Thank you for giving us your time today. Uh, massively appreciated. I know everyone with Knot Fest, the Slipknot family, the Ice Night Kills universe. Of course, Slipknot and Ice Night Kills will be touring together later this fall. Uh, we all love you. We all love the first Jason, the band, and the man, and. Uh, yeah, I got to say, Corey Taylor was so nice to me, and what a sweet person when we met him at Spookala. I've never met him before. Absolutely down to earth. Is so dedicated to the fans. But he took the time to tell me he has different autograph items from me, and uh I'm so, so happy. I see that they're going to be rocking out Wackenfest yeah. uh, in Germany, which is also something very, very amazing. So more power to Knotfest and more power to you, Ryan. Thank and you, And remember, sir. Jason never dies, bro. Indeed. <laughs>